Good evening and welcome to the Midland Board of Education regularly scheduled meeting on August 27th, 2012. Uh, Madam Secretary, would you call roll, please? Yes, President Malt. Here. Vice President Wasserman. Here. And I'm here. Treasurer Ole. Here. Member Branstad. Here. Member Gordon. Here. And Member Kaminsky. Here. Thank you. Before we move into the consent agenda, is there anything anybody would like removed or put on the regular agenda? Seeing none, we'll move through that. Uh, the first consent agenda item is 2.1, is the mi minutes from the last meeting on August 13, 2012. 2.2 .2 is the following person is recommended for employment 2012-13. 2.3 is the following staff members have announced their resignation effective date as indicated. 2.4 is the approval of payments for the school system's bills for the month of June 2012. 2.4B is the investment report from 2012. 2.4C is a listing of purchase orders exceeding $3,000 for June of 12. Uh, 2.4D is the list of purchase card transactions exceeding $3,000 for the month of June. I move approval of consent items 2.1 through 2.4. Support. Moved by Mr. Ole, supported by Mr. Wasserman. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same mm -hmm. sign. Consent agenda is approved. We have th at this time um, an opportunity for those in the viewing audience or a live audience request to address the board. Uh, no one has formally requested a uh, presentation, but uh, if you want to, now is your time to step up to the podium. Seeing none, <coughs> close the request to address the board. Presentations, and we'll turn that over to Mr. Ellinger and Mr. Costas. Uh, just one item this evening, um, very different than we typically bring to the board. Um, and that is we are beginning to identify the projects that we would use sinking fund dollars for for the following summer. So this is the summer of 2013. Uh, what you can see from your AIM document that was attached to um, your board packet is that there are four areas. Um, the total um, budget for this for next summer's work is only $75,000. That's quite less than the millions of dollars worth of work that we've been doing for 10 years. Uh, the reason for that is because the uh, sinking fund is running out and the tax collection uh, for that, the last tax collections for that is coming in with this summer's tax collection, I believe. And so uh, we have four major areas or minor areas, depending on how you look at it, that we'll be working on next summer. Um, district concrete replacement, uh, district floor tile replacement, the concrete work is 15,000. The floor tile replacement is an estimate, uh, including abatement, of about $45,000. Fence repair for $5,000 and parking lot crack ceiling um, for $10,000 uh, for a total of 75. We don't really need Mr. Costas to uh, give us much uh, more explanation than that. It is a very narrowed down list from what we typically do. And that's not an actionable item. It's just for the board to uh, take a look at. And as we move closer, we'll be asking for bids and so on and bringing back that back to the board. It does beg the question, however, and I'd see us talking about this sooner, not necessarily at tonight's meeting, but probably two weeks from tonight, about what is the uh, board's wishes for how we move forward in terms of funding future capital projects. And we put an initial list together that we have already shared with the uh, Finance um, Study Committee of the Board. We'll be updating that list um, at that meeting tomorrow afternoon uh, with those three board members, and we'll be bringing a discussion of that uh, conversation to the full board um, two weeks from tonight. Thank you. Comments? <coughs> yeah, one question. Sure. Carl, with, with us looking at $75,000 in capital projects for next year, it by no means says that we have $75,000 to spend. I mean, there's still some funds that were there for emergency purposes, uh, if I remember correctly? Yeah, if I, I didn't know that question was going to come up, or I would have been able to ask that very precisely, John, but the board gave us some direction and made some decisions mm -hmm. um, between money that you have put away, sales of property, that have been gone into the traditional PRME account for capital projects. I want to say there's close to $1.7 million in that, can you recall? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was about that level. And not to put you on the spot, but just to tell the public that we do have, yeah. we've thought about being conservative with something in case a boiler yeah. goes out or something along That's those right. lines. Yep. So it's a conservative approach to our capital projects. Between That's the right. two, there will be money left in the sinking fund 
uh, at the completion of this summer when all the projects have been paid for. I think it was pretty evenly split, about seven to 800,000 <laughs> remaining there and another 700,000 uh, in the, the PRME account. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, and I think that uh, it's probably a, uh, an opportunity to s just talk about, if you just think back and historically how much we've done with that sinking fund from, um, I mean, every building in our district has been impacted and some to a greater extent than others. But uh, I mean, there isn't a building that we, uh, you can't walk in, in our district and feel that can't feel good, it can't feel good about it. I mean, it's just the lighting, the electrical, and the roofs, the, uh, the boilers, everything's in, in an in a, uh, orderly state so that we can ensure that, um, you know, our students are in a, in a building that's uh, providing a quality environment. I mean, I think that's important uh, for those folks in the community to realize that that money was put to good use, so. It's important too, I think, for the community to realize that, um, I, I don't know, Mr. Ole would probably remember this, when uh, this Board of Education, as they, as they, it's only budget, beginning. As they budgeted, um, I think had an agreement with this community that they were putting, what, somewhere between one or two million dollars uh, yeah, every year into a, a budget dollars. to protect anything that would come up and to build for capital projects. Mm -hmm. and. It has been a long time, probably 10 years or better since we've been able to do that. That even goes back to way before my predecessors. So it's been back in the 70s, I want to say, is when PMRE started, which actually was at one time a millage. And even yeah. until we had proposed that it was a million dollars that we always had the discipline put aside. And that was been really important for this district. And we've learned a lot from all of our predecessors to maintain that discipline. So it, it really points out in my mind um, the importance of a future sinking fund election. At some point in time, the board will need to come back, I think it would be our advice to do so, to the community and ask for a restatement of that. Um, 1.7 million sounds like a lot of money, but that doesn't last very long when you have a boiler or a roof or uh, something mechanical um, or in an area where you have a lot of mechanical kitchen work and so on to use that up. When you have the amount of assets that uh, we have, um, that is not nearly enough to cover anticipated emergencies. Um, if there is such a thing. And so it's, um, it's a critical planning tool that I think is very strategic on behalf of the board to plan ahead and be thinking about, and uh, that's part of our discussion with FFO tomorrow. Very good. Yeah, and Carl, your comments well founded for uh, folks that are used to manufacturing industry in town. You know, we're spending less than 1% of our replacement asset value um, on these projects. Uh, not all of our maintenance, there's other, you know, custodial work and things of that nature, but we're spending less than 1% of our replacement asset base, and that's a very small ratio. Yeah. Very good discussion. Anything else on that, on that item? If not, we'll move on to an actionable item uh, and turn it over to Dr. Allison. Thank you, Mr. Malt. This evening I have a short story to tell you and a, and a brief presentation I'm going to ask uh, Carla Cook to talk about. Um, on July 18th, we received a wonderful email that said that there were some, some large funds, actually $47,484 available to us through the state of Michigan, which has come to us as a reallocation of non-used funds by other schools in the state of Michigan. And we uh, received the email on July 18th. And we know that these are unspent carryover funds that we call. They have to be fully <coughs> expended by September 30th. But the plan, including uh, the return of all the documentation, had to be submitted by July 27th. So it was Wednesday the 18th, and we had the next week to pull everything together. And fortunately for all, we uh, always have our uh, ducks pretty much in a row. And this money was 1D, which is for neglected and delinquent institutional um, entities. So this for us means the juvenile care facility. So in contacting Mark Butcher and Michelle Bell, who we work with all the time, and of course Carla and other staff members there may have had some parts in that, we said, what, what do we think we can turn over $47,484 in a month? And we're like, yes, we are shoppers. So we put together a plan, and when we reviewed the list, we were very happy to see that some of the things that are, were allowed were computers, iPads, Elmo, smart board software. And even at that, replacing all the things that uh, you see in your agenda, which I'll be asking for action for, 
we still had, that's a lot of money. But the very last piece on our list of uh, authorized activities said that we were not only able to use the money for the detention center, which is usually where all the money is spent, we also were allowed to use it for the day treatment program. So we were very excited, and that just opened up the planning for us. So we put together the plan, and we actually have um, our plans, as you see here this evening, where I'll be asking you to make a motion for $42,680 for technology. But we also had in our plan uh, the use of the uh, remaining funds for counseling services there. We usually use uh, a fair amount of our 1D money, which we get annually for counseling. And this is used for licensed therapists to provide uh, parenting skills, role-playing, mindfulness, in order to use both substance abuse and impulse control counseling with the students. So both of those items will be purchased. Uh, we really need your approval this evening on the um, hardware and software pieces. We actually, when I was talking to Carla about it, she told such a good story that I said, gee, Carla, how would you like to come and talk with the board? Because I think we haven't really talked about the Juvenile Care Center program for a while, and it seems like we might have a few minutes here to allow her to um, tell us exactly what we would be using this technology for. So Carla, and uh, she will introduce her colleague uh, who will be taking over the juvenile care facility as well, Danielle Rutterbush. So I want to approach the podium. OK. <laughs> Yes, this is Danielle Rutterbush, and she will be transitioning uh, into the role of the Juvenile Care Center principal over the next month um, to so we can share the duties. But it's certainly been a pleasure to work in that capacity. And I am very excited that Dr. Ellison was able to capture this additional funding for us because, of course, technology is important in all aspects of education. But with what we do at the Juvenile Care Center, it really becomes a critical aspect of our instruction. And there was a funding change a few years ago that has prevented us, particularly in the day treatment program, from obtaining some of the upgrades that we've needed. Our computers there have uh, been quite outdated and unable to update for the last couple of years. And the reason it's critical is because in the, in the detention program, we serve up to 22 students who are probably 50% of them from Midland County and the other 50% from mid-Michigan to northern Michigan counties. And they transition out of there quite quickly. They're with us a few days, sometimes week, in a few cases, maybe months. And while they're with us, we have one teacher who is working with them to continue to progress in the Michigan Mayor curriculum because generally we're serving high school students. And of course, when you're serving 9th through 12th graders, having the opportunity to access technology and some of the great courses that are online allows the teacher to do some direct instruction as well as electronic learning. In the day treatment component, we serve only Midland County students. And many of those students are, of course, Midland public students. And what we want to do is help them get back on track. So they come to us for a semester or a year and generally, they're behind in credits. So a big focus is to help them recapture some lost credits and get in good standing so that when we transition them back to their local high school, they are in good shape to graduate. And we tend to be very excuse me, successful in, in that endeavor. And of course, we do it again with the combination of the electronic learning. And then we have two teachers who are providing some direct instruction. So, this new technology will definitely be put to great use. Questions? Go ahead, Jen. With, the, with that facility, is it, um, it, would there be any problems with the laptop supporting, or the, I'm sorry, the, the, the computer network uh, supporting and working with the laptop? They use laptops now, and they are linked to our system. Linked to the system, and, mm -hmm. and so, um, is there any wireless capability in the building at all? Building is all wireless. Okay. okay real quick. Any other questions or comments? Well, I knew about it um, through a different source, Dr. Adelson, but I was ex almost as excited as he was when I found out about it. And wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And if you had not had an opportunity as a board member to go out there and experience what they what they're doing out there, 
I would uh, ask all of you at some point to go out there and, and just and see what these uh, people are doing, uh, the staff and, and our staff from the MPS and the staff there at, at, at the Juvenile Care Center uh, do an outstanding job. And the multi-systemic piece with the day treatment is having huge success uh, with turning some young lives around. And, uh, you know, if in, this, in that process, this grant or this additional funding adds to that, uh, that, that capability and, and success rate, then uh, it, it, uh, it was very, uh, very good endeavor to embark on and to enhance that capability out there. So it's a great, it's a great I mean, we can feel very proud of the fact that we're part of that process out there because it's uh, we're uh, a model for the state of Michigan in, in many respects in that regard. And again, I'll follow on the well, first couple of years on the board, I got to go out a few times and programs out there, it really shows the diversity of, of kids that we have to serve or that we are serving and the range of things we have to do and the talents of staff differences we have to have to, to do different things for different folks at different times in different ways and uh, you know these are kids that are on the ropes and uh, this makes a big difference and uh, those are kids that uh, we're gonna have to pay for one way or the other I'd rather pay for grant early than, than down the road so thank you for all your efforts and I'm glad the state had a little bit of money to help us out that way thank you, thank you. yes okay so the um, item is that I'm uh, seeking your approval to deliver a purchase order to trivalent group of Mount Pleasant for $42,680 to upgrade the oldest laptops at the Juvenile Care Center mobile lab. Pricing includes the purchase of 44 Hewlett Packard 6570B laptop computers as well as configuration and installation. The computers being replaced are between five and seven years of age. This price is bid by the Western States Contracting Alliance of, the, of which the state of Michigan is a member and the purchase is indeed being funded by Title I Part D Sub two grant. For its pleasure. So moved. Support. Moved by Dr. Kaminsky, supported by Mr. Washerman. Any further comments or questions? Um, two questions, pretty simple ones. It's, it's implied that the entire uh, films are covered by the uh, by the funding from the state, that's correct? It is correct. Okay. And number two, I can't imagine there's a whole lot of legacy cost to us down the road as we go along and just ultimately be a decision on replacement or not replacement someday. That's correct. Correct also. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Thank you. Um, we have a motion on the table uh, to, to, to fund or yeah, to fund these 44 Hewlett Packard uh, laptops. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You have your new computers. Thank you very much. Moving on to finance and Mrs. Klein. This evening we have four gifts. The first two are for information only. The Walmart Vision Center donated a digital projector for district use. And then Aaron and Esther Oberlin have provided support for at-risk students in a program at Midland High School. And I, I would like to single them out because this is not the first year of this gift. They've been very generous over the years. And I believe all their children have graduated from Midland High School at this time, but in recognition for the good work that they've seen Midland High School do, they continue to make that one of their, their donor priorities every year. Uh, then we have two PTOs that even though school has not even started, they like to get ahead and do their major giving early in the year when all the items that they're interested in may be purchased and put into use in the classroom. So we have the Plymouth School PTO and the Chestnut Hill PTO both donating in total $24,215 to support a number of different items, anything from classroom magazines, field trips, uh, you name it. Each building has uh, a list of items that they appreciate support for, and this is what all those PTO fundraisers go for. So those two because each one exceeds $5,000 requires your action. It's moved. Support, Mr. Clark. Moved by Mr. Holy, supported by Mr. Wasserman. Uh, we're not having started the school year yet. <laughs> Many. I mean, tomorrow is officially <coughs> the first day, and like, a, you know, I mean, it, it's uh, uh, continuous. I mean, it, uh, it, 
was evident last year at the end of the school year, and now it's beginning before we even start this year. So what a great uh, opportunity. So we have a motion with support. Uh, any questions? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Plymouth PTOs and Chestnut Hill PTO, along with uh, Walmart and the Oberlands. Moving on to human resources, man, Mr. Verlindi. Thank you. Uh, the board and the staff would like to extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Mrs. Catherine Wilson, who was the secretary for the Midland Public Schools from 1966 through 1979. She passed away recently on July 29th. Condolences to her friends and family. Um, moving on to technology with uh, Mr. Valendi again. Yes, before I get into um, the actual uh, recommendation that I'm bringing to you, I want you to know that over the last year and a half, two years, we've been keeping a pretty close eye as an administrative team, as uh, 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 teachers and professionals, and uh, um, as a technology group at some of the new technologies and their potential impact on learning. Um, and instruction within the Midland Public Schools. I'm sure you've heard Mr. Ellinger talk uh, quite a bit over the uh, time that he has been here about the need for um, technology um, so that we can find uh, even better ways to instruct our students um, as the technology moves forward. Looking at the research, looking at all the uh, literature, we're convinced that this, uh, some of this newest technology, specifically the tablets, the iPads, the iOS um, uh, system, offers some great possibilities. But we don't want to um, uh, plunge in uh, to a change until we have a, a really good feel for it. So we've been in touch with a lot of districts uh, across the state and in Texas and uh, states across the United States that have started iPad initiatives. And now we're ready for the next step, which is not just accepting their experiences and their literature and their research, but to put it in the hands of our professionals, our teachers, as a first step here, and have them size up what its potential use can be, um, how it allows them to bring instructional um, uh, technology one-on-one -on -one to students. And we want to start experimenting with that. So what I bring to you tonight is a purchase order for $20,900 to purchase 50 um, second generation uh, iPads, which we will put in the hands of teachers uh, this coming fall. And this will be uh, a precursor to something we're going to bring to you next uh, week with a full presentation of the research we are planning on doing with um, iPads and iTouches and uh, potentially laptops going forward. Um, so, um, and we will give it in the context of kids having these, um, at least in a limited role, so that we can learn from the experience and then make possibly better recommendations to you where we might go with this uh, in the future. But we want to bring this first part to you now because the more time that uh, the teachers can have it in their hands prior to it coming to the students' hands, the better prepared uh, we can be. And quite honestly, um, there's quite a bit of setup that needs to be done to manage this going forward uh, once we receive those and get, then get them in the hands of the teachers. The purchase order is uh, to Apple uh, in uh, Cupertino, California. And I, sh I want to point out that this is not um, additional funding we are asking for. This is taking our normal IT budget at the same levels that we've had before, uh, virtually. There's just a small uh, carryover here for finishing up the wireless project. But it's the same budget that we've had, but we've reorganized some of the priorities and put some things down the road because if we find this is a viable uh, path to go forward, it may make some of those initiatives what we had originally planned on doing um, unnecessary. Computer labs across the board, uh, whatever the case may be. So uh, this is budgeted money from the IT budget that is going into this and the next uh, part of the project, which we'll explain next time. Um, and it is not an incre we're not asking for increases in the general fund budget. It is the budgeted money. So moved. Moved by Mr. Wasserman, supported by Mr. Oley. Uh, questions of Mr. Valindi. Hi. Angela. I have two questions. The first one is 
Can you ever lease stuff like this, or do you always have to purchase it? You can lease it, but it depends what you plan to do long term. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you were uh, going to be seeking uh, funds to do it on a, a large scale, you can't cover that under any kind of um, you know millage or bond or anything. Um, plus, we the way we see it is we're going to purchase these to start out with, and if we find it is not something. Uh, that uh, is going to be valuable across uh, the board with a variety of kids. We have a variety of other uses that we can repurpose these iPads for. And uh, we may do that even with some of the kids' uh, um, iPads next year. So we have contingency b built in. The leasing option is fairly expensive, um, and um, it, you're kind of limited in how you fund that. You pretty much have to do it completely out of general fund. And my second question was, are you putting these across all disciplines and all levels of teachers, or are you targeting as, a certain As we'll area? explain in the uh, project next week with a full presentation, PowerPoint, okay. et cetera, what we'll explain is we are going to start out primarily uh, at the elementaries, because I think that's where uh, we can get some uh, great research. And secondly, the visual nature, the interactive nature seems um, uh, pretty key um, at that level and we are also going to um, use some of those iPads and put them in the hands of students in, in some of our secondary buildings in special ed self-contained programs there are so many potential uses for those in that those programs and then we'll see where we go from there expanding further with uh, uh, more action research such as this or coming to you with recommendations long term. Plus, we down the road, we also have a question of, OK, as you get into secondary high school, let's say, is an iPad the way to go, or is a laptop the way to go? There are different needs and different uses. But we, we think the most fertile ground right now to start with in this limited experiment is um, special ed and the elementaries. There's a little more articulation of how we're going to use technology that's in the district tech plan, and this board adopted that about mid-year last year. I can't remember if it was just when you came on the board or afterward, Angela. And then at the tail end of the year, in a facilities finance and operations meeting with the three of you that are on that study committee, you asked us to spend some time this summer getting much more specific about how we would use our technology dollars, even out in the future. And that's difficult to do to predict what the needs are. Mm -hmm. This is a step in that direction to get some iPads, in this case for staff. In a couple of weeks, we'll talk about what we'd like the, uh, what kind of action we'd like the board take to actually get them out in the hands of kids. And it's in response to what the board requested back. I forget if that was in May or if that was in June. Um, we have detailed everything out that will also result in an amendment to the three-year technology plan that the board adopted last year. The state requires you to have a plan that lasts for three years and um, Chris Sabrin took a lead in writing that plan on behalf of all of you, all of us in the district and um, did really an outstanding job with it but we needed to tweak that to get much more specific and you'll see those details uh, in a couple weeks. Josh. Just a comment, uh, I, I really appreciate us looking at other school systems and best practices and I, um, I just happen to be reading a newspaper uh, for a rural community in northern Michigan and one thing that they're going to do is they're going to look at having iPads in all the elementary school uh, kids' hands. Every kid would have one and I thought how could Roscommon County do that? <laughs> you, know, it, you know, so it, it's just, it, it's a smaller school, easier to do and so forth but uh, I just see a lot of this taken off and and a lot of other schools are doing good things in that direction. And then uh, to our technology director, Blake Sobel, appreciate the, the spearheading and getting things going sooner. I, I don't know if some of the technology upgrades and changes in that direction can wait. It's just going so fast in that direction. And this is uh, very, very foresighted to get at least some feedback and kind of get, um, get those creativity coming in, uh, right. from our in, staff. In size of a district um, can be um, important in implementing. The last thing you want to do is not have thought through the implementation or the management sure. in a classroom, which our teachers are so wonderful at anticipating with kids having these 
um, instruments in their hands and taking care of them and knowing about digital uh, citizenships. Our, our staff would be um, marvelous uh, in doing that. Uh, Ross Common, you had mentioned that uh, the other day. That's 1,700 enrollment. Blake's been on the phone quite a bit with McAllen, Texas, mm -hmm. and they're putting, what, 21,000 iPads this fall in the hands of students? <laughs> now, talk about implementation <laughs> questions. Yeah. But we want to know exactly. for our kids, <laughs> our teachers, our <coughs> community, uh, what it can do. And the best way is let's get it in the hands of the kids. Let's get it in the hands um, of uh, the teachers. And we already have started back in June getting it in the hands of administrators who have been doing research on this and will be asked to be instructional leaders in this. And, and just, just one more comment is, is that what we did, I think, uh, last uh, fall is we did allow for teachers to use uh, some of the devices that, that kids may have. So teachers may be able to have and dovetail this into what students can bring these things to class and, and use it as part of interactive learning. So not, <coughs> not that we have devices for all the kids just yet, but there has been some guidelines set how, those, how these devices are used in the classroom in case students wanted to have them had their own as part of the classroom. So just to add that. Anything else? I'm uh, impressed by the fact that we are uh, we're taking the lead on to uh, go forward and see what works best for our district. You know, you know, I can appreciate Ross Common and I can appreciate Texas and their and, and what they're doing, but uh, you know, we'll know what's best for us based on that experiment. And, and it's truly an experiment in, in a in a research kind of uh, mode at this point. But I think that's. That's how we learn how to do it best and how we uh, have been successful in the past with many other programs we've implemented, implemented at, the, at, uh, at this district. And I think once we understand how that works best for us, then uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to showcase um, many of the things that we, we already do well uh, and just have that technology to support it and make it imp and, and improve on, uh, on it. So I think it's a great opportunity. So. This is an actionable item, and we have a motion and support on the table. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You have your Thank you. New iPads. With that, we'll move on to correspondence to and from the Board of Education. You all have had that <coughs> in your agenda since uh, uh, Cindy sent it to us last week. Um, and the regular schedule activities as uh, for the rest of the uh, the calendar year are posted for uh, up through December 10th and with that um, we have studies discussion do we want to talk about um, the book your, your book Carl I thought I might go around first uh, th there may not be anything where it's still the summertime but if not then I thought we'd finish up with the book okay I'll start to my right with mr. what uh, I think my annual be my ninth or tenth annual plea. Um, school starting, as everybody knows, here soon. Uh, kids are going to be out racing to school and groups and packs and everything else, and maybe not paying as much attention as they should at intersections, etc. So I just ask the uh, grown-ups in the district to take extra care driving as uh, school begins over the next several weeks, as our kids get reacclimated to being more alert to their surroundings. Also, uh, let's make sure every kid that goes to school comes home from school. Just a board member comments or talk about the book too or um, just <coughs> comments right now just comments um, I saw a wonderful article in the paper that had detailed some of the uh, of the efforts with the neighborhood re revitalization effort around Carpenter Elementary and just a big thanks to Dow Chemical Company and also to our local Habitat for Humanity and the overall thought that I, I took home from that is good safe neighborhoods definitely support uh, good education I thought that was very uh, very very good um, and working in the hot sun too, I might add it, with some of the hot weather. Um, today I came in and I had lunch with the new teachers and staff. It's, I think we have roughly 19, uh, 17 that we brought in. It's nice to chit chat with a few of them and just welcome them aboard. Appreciate appreciate having you as part of the MPS family. All right. Well, I feel like school has already started. So I know a lot, of, a lot of sporting events have already started, which we've been participating in. So it's very fun that's going. And then. Um, to go off what Jerry said about people being careful, I've been thinking there's so much since I've been on the board and we've been through so much with the teachers and everything. And I think I just want to say that this year, 
make sure that the parents step up and make sure the kids, you know, do their homework every night and for parents to really pay attention to what their kids are bringing home because we know that teachers can't do it all and they can present it to your child, but if your child doesn't meet them at least halfway, they're not going to get the benefit that we're trying to provide for them here. I too I had a chance to uh, meet some of the new teachers today at the lunch which was very nice and I think teachers get younger and younger rather than me getting older. <laughs> I, uh, one young man I introduced him, uh, myself to him and I said you know what your grandparents and my parents were very good friends. I used to play with your, your dad and your aunt and uncle and uh, I thought wow I, time has really moved on. And at the same time, I delivered my youngest to, to Michigan State this weekend. And um, so it'll be a little different experience, not having a child at MPS after 26 years. But I assure you, I will be in and out of buildings and enjoying a lot of the activities that will be upcoming. And, um, and I hope to, to get into the classroom and, and um, see, what, see what's going on and enjoy all the ex extracurricular activities as well. And I guess I would say enjoy this last week of vacation because uh, weather's great, and before we know it, the year will be flying by, and and uh, we have a busy year ahead of us. That's it. I wanted to thank you for your presentation about the uh, juvenile care center. I really don't know a whole lot about it, so I want to get out there and see what it's like. Um, and I want to congratulate you on your new position. That is a new position for you, right? Okay, well, I'm sure you're going to find it challenging, and I hope you also find it rewarding. So thanks for coming tonight. And I also wanted to say that um, when I was looking at the uh, gifts from the Plymouth School PTO and Chestnut Hill PTO, I was kind of flashing back to my years at Chestnut Hill PTO, and I know how much work goes into all those efforts, and I would like to say, too, that I saw Lynn at a lot of those. Um, we worked on a lot of those together, but... Um, I just really commend them for their hard work. It is a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun, too. And so a lot of good things come out of that. So I think that's really great. What they've done already, as Ken said, the school hasn't even started. So I'm sure they're just going to keep going. I uh, just want to thank everybody for the gifts, too. Uh, Walmart and um, uh, the Oberlin's, as well as Plymouth and Chestnut Hill School. It's a great way to start the year. I um, want to wish everybody good luck at the start of the new school year. Um, also, need to, I can't resist doing a shout out to Andrew Maxwell, one of our own, who's uh, going to be taking the national limelight Friday night as a starting <laughs> quarterback in the Big Ten. Doesn't happen very often. Right. I don't really just want to wish him well, and he will represent us well. And um, maybe even more important, he's a great athlete. He's just an outstanding kid, an outstanding student. And oftentimes we focus on athletic ability, which is really important, but it takes much more than that to be successful at that level. So I wanted to wish him well. Um, since we last met, it has become obviously public that, um, just like Ken, I've chosen not to run again uh, for the school board, and, uh, and within a few months, Lynn will become the senior member of this board, probably. Um, and I guess I, I'm going to have, you know, probably three or four months to kind of reflect on all the things I've been privileged to be a part of and witness and participate in over the last 20, Roger said 21 years, just about 20 years uh, right now. Um, and I guess I, I want to probably most importantly, thank the four people that have stepped up to run, to have the, the courage, I guess, to kind of step up and uh, run for school board. And I know we have one of the candidates here. And uh, I guess I wanted to, to thank them for that, but also suggest to them that um, don't, don't just take the time to prepare to run for office. Prepare yourself to serve. This is a, this is a big job. It's a complex job, and everybody up here knows how complex that job is. And it takes a lot of a lot of different skills. It takes a lot of broad thinking, and it takes listening skills and leadership skills, and it requires patience, and uh, it requires uh, positive attitudes, and maybe most importantly, it requires passion and commitment and stuff. And so I would really shout out to the four candidates running to please take advantage of this time to um, get into schools, talk to teachers, talk to parents, uh, talk to Carl, talk to all the directors and our leadership, talk to administrators. Uh, talk to teachers, and I think all of us, I'd certainly be willing to help out and talk to anybody who would like to talk about what it means to be on the school board and what needs. And I think we'd all be willing to help out and spend some time with them and stuff. So I look forward to the next three or four months um, um, with some sadness, quite frankly, but I'll reserve that for the December meeting, and I won't get into it now. Um, but it's just been my privilege to uh, serve. And as you think through these decisions, I'm sure Ken has too. I mean, I'm not quite as old as Lynn because I only was an MPS parent for 25 years, not 26 years <laughs> and stuff. Um, oh. 
But I've been, I've been removed for three years now. My youngest is starting the senior year um, this week at Michigan State and stuff. And um, I think that's important to, to stay connected. And I think it's important that we have fresh ideas, that we have new perspectives and new experiences. Um, and I think that's important. And so I think it's time. I think it's time. So um, this board has um, excelled because of the excellence of the people in the commitment that are sitting here on this board. And I'm sure whoever gets elected in December to replace, or in November to replace Ken and I in December and January will also have that same passion and commitment and do a great job. So I just wanted to kind of acknowledge that. So more to come down the road. So thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's no secret. I mean, I thank Roger. I, I think we talked about uh, a slow news day on Friday uh, to be above the crease uh, on, uh, in the headlines. Um, but in large part, I mean, we, um, it, it was a tough decision, but I made a comment uh, early in my uh, tenure on, on this board that as long as I had a child in the district, which I feel very strongly about, and nothing, no disrespect to any of my board members who don't have children in the district that will remain and some that will come after I'm gone, uh, that uh, have children that have been in the district and, and now have left. But I believe that that connection to, for me made it uh, uh, an experience that I could see some feedback from occasionally uh, in, uh, in conversation with my ch uh, two daughters. Um, and everybody knows, or a good ne number of people know, that my youngest graduated in June. Um, and so um, while uh, again, it was a tough decision. Uh, I think it was the right decision at this point in my life, and um, I'm certain that uh, at least uh, at least my wife told me that she was glad she'd see me home on Monday nights uh, uh, a bit more often. Um, uh, I think that uh, it's a new chapter for me in my life, and I think that uh, I've learned a great deal. Um, and for those um, who come to the board with any preconceived notion that they really have a clear understanding of how school districts run, uh, especially one of this size. Uh, I think there's still a learning curve for, for, more, for, more, for more, most people. So um, I, I will miss it, uh, but I think that um, uh, I'll leave it, I will leave it in the good hands of the, of the, of the uh, remaining existing board members with the opportunity to, to, ten, uh, to give some insight to the new ones that come on board. So I'm, I, I feel comfortable with that. So um, tomorrow's first day. I will be there. I think there's a couple of other board members who have indicated they will be there tomorrow morning at Central Middle School to welcome our staff and kick off the official first day of school. And I'm looking forward to that. It will be my last opportunity. Uh, but uh, I look forward to it every year, ever since I've been on the board to uh, that day. And I think it's a great day to, uh, a great way to start th the day. So um, Rick gave a shout out to Andrew Maxwell uh, at Michigan State, and, and, and rightfully so, a great young man and a great athlete. But I'd like to give a shout out to all the MPS uh, college athletes. And there's a number of them from both Midland and Dow High that out, went on to the college ranks this year. And uh, you know, just think about that for a moment, how many that actually are participating in D1 and D2 and junior college and NAIA. And I, you know, there aren't very many uh, in, in, in a, from a percentage standpoint that ever get that opportunity. And I think that's a, that's a, uh, that's a huge um, uh, statement on behalf of our student athletes and what they excel to and uh, hope to accomplish uh, in that vein. So um, I'm looking forward to the uh, remainder of my term, um, again, with some regrets. Um, but I think that um, given what we've learned this evening um, with technology and, the, and the, the, some of the new things that we're looking at um, that the board's talking about in committee with respect to new programs and new opportunities, I'm, I'm excited again from MPS. And I think that this is uh, a true moment of opportunity uh, for this district. Um, uh, we've been excellent in our past, and we'll, we'll be, we will continue that excellence in our future. And uh, um, I would, I'm very pleased to have been a part of it. So, and thank you. So, with that, Mr. Ellinger. Uh, just um, before we get to my final comments um, about some discussion here at the board level, uh, a few weeks ago I asked if uh, you were interested. If you would read this book by Jamie Volmer uh, called Schools Can't Do It Alone, Cannot Do It Alone. And um, it was an interesting read. Um, I think it challenges some thinking that a lot of people have that have not read the book and that it really causes all of us to examine the views that we have about school based on our own experiences of going through school. 
and to come to grips with the fact that schools have taken on so much more. He does a superb job in the book of mentioning almost decade by decade, really well over 100 years, on how the criticisms that we often hear now that we think are germane and that we've never heard before have actually been around for over a century when you look at what the purpose of education first was in the uh, back in the late 1800s and uh, early uh, 1900s here. Um, but I think even uh, equally important is a meeting that Dr. Ellison and Steve Poole, our central middle school principal, and myself attended last week. I think it was just the three of us uh, there from MPS. There was a public forum on education sponsored by the uh, Center for Michigan, and I think Lynn had an opportunity to attend this at Saginaw Valley when they did their forum. And it was a very interesting um, uh, early morning that started, I believe, at 7 or 7.30, and it was over by 9.30. And we all had clickers like the technology that we've seen here, and it was a facilitated discussion by a think tank out of Ann Arbor that is um, very close to the governor. And it's a nonpartisan um, think tank um, that is trying to reach out to over 5,000 people in the state of Michigan. And we talked a lot of, uh, about a lot of issues, what the general perception is of public education in the state, what needs drive, what education needs to be in the future, how happy people are and what specific programs exist locally that people are particularly pleased with and that our community thinks um, is effective. I think the paper even did an article on it that I thought was um, well done. But interestingly enough, when they got toward the end of the meeting, they put eight priorities um, up on the, um, on the screen, and the number one priority for 100% of the people in the room was there needs to be more support for public education in the state of Michigan. And that is the first time for me in a number of years, frankly, all the years that I've been here in Midland uh, for the last five, that I've gotten the sense that this pendulum that has been swinging over that has been very critical of public education, uh, driven, I think, in large measure by the state's economic um, circumstances of not being able to afford legacy costs and many of the costs associated with education. But it was a recognition, I think, by most people in that room that maybe that pendulum had swung far enough and it was time to build support back for teachers and for administrators and for public schools, but most importantly, for children. Um, because there is an enormous amount of stress that educators are under in the state right now. So I want to read you just one paragraph that's going to be in my speech, my part of the speech to staff tomorrow. We actually have a very uh, upbeat meeting plan. We have a guest speaker, from, an instructor from Delta College, um, Jeff Vandes Andy, that is going to be our keynote um, speaker that has a very positive address on what it means to be an educator, not just a teacher, but an educator, because we have a lot of employees here that are role models to children, not just those that are certificated. And so this is what I wanted to read um, to you. Um, given this community discussion that I characterize, I'll be asking our, our group to um, think about doing the daily job of actually making a quality education happen here at MPS. And what does that mean? And in some respects, it means that educators are being held uh, more accountable for academic performance than ever before in their careers. It means that um, everyone is left to explain to our community the state's multiple evaluation systems being used to rate schools and teachers. For example, from report card grades to adequate yearly progress at both the building level, which all our buildings have made, but we didn't make as a district because of a special needs population that wasn't able to, to test because it wasn't large enough at one of our high schools. Two percentile rankings of schools from the pop, uh, top to bottom list of all the schools in the state of Michigan. Um, in order to meet waivers of the no child left behind federal law, schools who are being labeled as priority focus or reward schools. And you know what? The public in our community are beginning to be confused by all this data. It's not helping our public understand the quality of the education in the communities that we serve. And I think some are becoming upset about it because there just isn't enough support for public education. And I don't want people who are watching the broadcast to think that what I mean by that is financial support. That is certainly a challenge. But I think there's a lack of general moral support for the value of public education. And this community discussion was, I thought, very clear about the fact that from the legislative level to some of our local levels to the influence that business has on it, there is some confusion about what the purpose of education is. 
And for me, this book went a long way toward kind of coalescing all that information and bringing it together. Because a lot of the board members know that I'm very active with a group here in town called MyTech Plus, who in general has been very supportive of public education. They've paid for me and for a number of our staff to travel to um, uh, Indiana, to uh, Texas, to take a look at other ways that other states and school districts are providing an education. So they've been very generous um, to us, I think, for all the right reasons. But they have a point of view on what education should be and what purpose it should serve. And that is a voice that we should listen to. But it isn't the only voice that we should listen to. I'm working with another group called the Community Success Panel that has our executive director of the Chamber of Commerce here, has some very key civic leaders who have been very active during their lives here in the community. It has the mayor involved. It has some realtors in the area. It has uh, some people from Midland Tomorrow on the group. They have read the same book. And it's going to become the um, focus of our next discussion when we get together. Because their dream is if Midland Public Schools was the very best school district in the nation, what would it take to make that happen? What would that look like? Would it be exactly what we have? Would it be some of what we have? Would it be different than what we have? And that is another group that I work with. There's another group here in town that's interested in having conversation because they have some ideas um, about <coughs> where certain kinds of kids should receive their education. What do we do to cater to the top 20% of our learners? And how do we do that without watering down uh, those students' experience as they come through our system? What do we do to take care of those that are on the bottom 20%, those students that may take a longer time period or demand a different kind of learning style in order to be successful in school? And there is only so much time for you as board members and for me uh, as superintendent and administrators and key people with an interest in education to work with all these independent groups. So what the author of this book does is present an option for engaging the entire community in a conversation about the future of its schools. I can't see much of a downside to this. There's been a long history of committees that this board has operated that is one way to carry on that community conversation, but it's not the only way. And typically, those have been done in the past by asking parents and those interested to come in the evening when they're busy and they have other obligations. Well, if you read the book, you know what um, Bomer said. He said, take time and go to where your parents and your interested parties are during the workday and ask those businesses to <coughs> release the employees and incentivize those businesses to work along with you and their employees as, as you have a conversation that can drive the district. Why I thought it was good timing to study this book, and this will be the last thing that I say, so then I'll be curious about your comments, is that in the next three years, um, whoever the Board of Education is has some pretty big issues that they're going to be challenged with. And uh, in, in no small respect, it's to continue the funding that we have because the uh, millage for our operating millage and our hold harmless millage, which every district that has those millages absolutely have to have or they can't survive financially. Those are coming due in 2014 and 2015. This is the time for us to engage our community to give us some honest feedback, to ask their ideas on what they could do. This is just one way. It's not the only way. I wouldn't even propose to you that it's the best way. But it's one way based on what people think they understand about schools for us to engage them in conversation. So I thought as representatives of this community, starting with asking the seven of you to read the book would be a reasonable first step. So what did you think? Discussion. <laughs> well, I'll start. I was, I was going to try not to be the first okay, one. Okay, I'll, star I'll start. I'll start. And I, and I can tell you, I, I, this is based on my experience in this community, not just as a school board member, but with other initiatives throughout the, throughout the um, Midland, uh, greater Midland community. Um, any success that uh, from a community perspective with respect to a large scale impact on the community came by virtue of the fact that we had uh, uh, representatives from across the board in, in involved in the process of that success. And I think that this book speaks volumes to that. I think that, uh, you know, I think he captures it and it might be letting the cat out of the bag as to my comments tomorrow morning, but uh, it, 
it's funny how you you read the whole book and you and you pick out certain things that you note and and and, and highlight. But I think in his last comment on page 207, it sort of captures it all right now for this district and this community. And that's the, and I'll quote it, um, but the conditions are finally right for all Americans to do, to do their part, to join together in a common purpose and help their educators create the schools we need and in that, in that process build the communities of our most noble dreams. Public education is a miracle and this is the most hopeful time. And we're there. We're, I mean, we're absolutely there. I believe, I, I believe that. I think that, you know, based again, my, some my personal experience in this community, on any initiative, what, whether I was in law enforcement or I was at the foundation, anything that was a larger scale and, and had su great success, it wasn't based on uh, one organization doing it alone. It was based on a number of organizations, <coughs> a number of people from across the community, not just from uh, roles as leaders of the community, but it, you know, just people who live here and have a passion about what we are and who we are here. And that's, you know, we, you know, I've said this many, many times, we all live here for the most part because of the quality of life we experience here. And in that quality of life, our educational uh, experience for our, our, our students, our children, uh, is embedded in that. And I think that that's, you know, our success moving forward with, with this premise, what he basically was saying throughout, the, through, through the entire book was, was, was spot on. I think it was, uh, it's critical. You know, it's, you know, it doesn't matter that Rick and I are leaving the board if we're, maybe at some point we're, we're involved with some other part of this process and, and helping this district continue its success. And I think I, I would agree with his last, his last statement is that we have an opportunity. We're, we're there. We're at that point. And, and I would agree with you on, with respect to um, the pendulum is starting to swing. And I think it's, you, you as you read through the book and you started thinking about what's happening at the state level and the local level and different aspects, I think while money and finances are obviously an issue, there needs that we've gone through this vetting of sorts and now we have an opportunity to make and mold this the way we think uh, will be best for our students uh, in, in the future and moving forward. came away with um, two fundamental boxes, if I want to think of it that way. I'm trying to aggregate my thoughts. One is one that uh, teachers and a, uh, a teacher who eventually became a principal for us years ago told me when I was first running for school board, is everybody's an expert in public education because they all experienced it. And he spends a lot of time talking about that. Uh, what different people's viewpoints of what should be delivered, how it should be delivered, uh, when it should be delivered off semi hostage to their personal experiences of the past, some of which were good and some of which were bad, but uh, whatever that was. With that, my concern as we go forward and his prescription on how to go forward, um, no quarrel with. Uh, it, uh, I didn't find it rocket science in terms of how to reach out to multiple groups in a community and all that kind of stuff. It's more methodical. What I left was the whole of my of the thinking was if we engage our community on what our schools should be in the future, and we should engage our community on what our schools should be in the future. How do we get people to think outside of their historic experience to jump to the conclusion of what should be is what was? And that's where the country in a large degree is, and to some degree, a large degree where our community is, as I talk to different people. I'll talk to different people about, well, our tech ed used to be a lot better because it was done this way and out here our college prep was a lot better because we did this and that um, but a lot of it is what he called I can't remember his terminology was uh, nostalgia uh, nostalgia and amnesia you know selective remembering and I can pick that up from people even in our community who is very geared to education and very concerned about where education is going so if we embark on a a mission to understand what our schools of the future in Midland should be. How do we challenge our community to think out of their nostalgia to what should be, and what <coughs> kids' skills should be in the future, and what knowledge they should have in the future, and what abilities they should have in the future, hence how should that be delivered in the future, is where my concern is. How do we, how do we embed that kind of thinking so people get out of the box and think differently than maybe they traditionally have? 
I, let me, if I could just kind of piggyback on what, what Jerry said. I, I found it a great read, and I read it one day on Saturday, and then it stimulated a discussion and questions I had for my wife, but then picked it up and read it all day on Sunday. <laughs> and in fact, although I'm kind of, you know, kind of, I probably can say this publicly, but she's so interested she's going to take it to her book club tomorrow and suggest that they read this at the book club, which oh, is maybe great. part of the great conversation, right? Get every book club in, the Mid yep. in Midland reading this kind of thing, and it starts the great conversation. It also prompted me to have a conversation with my daughter, who's finished five years of teaching and is getting her writing her dissertation in education right now, kind of thing. So, even though I've been around involved for a long time, it's stimulating thinking that I guess I never articulated. And, and back to your point, Jerry, is he made a big point that says nothing will change until we change the culture of the community right. that's in there. And that's very true. And, and you're right, for as, as supportive and as wonderful as our community is, we are also resistant to change because we think we've been very successful with things <laughs> as they have been. Exactly. And, you know, we all, no matter how many years we've been on the school board, we can think back to initiatives or suggestions or ideas, but doing things differently and how much resistance we got. And I don't say that in a negative way. It's just, you know, why break a, a good thing, supposedly, in people's eyes. Um, I even kind of wondered these very simple questions that probably all of our professionals have thought through a, a long time. And I kind of challenged my, my daughter, who's, you know, doing a PhD in this, it said, we're in this box, and it was wonderful to look back on the historical perspective of going back for decades, and it was mind-boggling to see all the curriculum additions we made every decade when he kind of reviewed that. Yeah. And uh, what was it, the TTSP, this too shall pass kind of thing, yeah. you know? I'm thinking, my gosh, so we've added an unbelievable list of things to the curriculum. We had the same length of school day, the same <laughs> length of school year. And here's the box I get caught up in and said, we're in this box, and I'm, I'm thinking elementary right now, where we have kind of aggregated people according to their age, saying that is the best way to learn, that we put all the eight-year-olds together, we put all the nine-year-olds together, we put all the 10-year-olds together, realizing, though, because you kind of learn this in, in, in high school and college, that, that there's always a gap. You always have people that are different spots in that learning, and their pace of learning, and, and other things that have affected them from a societal standpoint and developmental standpoint and all kind of thing, but we've determined that it's best that the eight-year-olds learn together rather than the people that are at this level of reading work with this same group and the people that are at this level of math and realizing that that, that spot on the spectrum is different for every subject for every person. And so I even said, challenged my wife, well, why do we have to have all the third graders all have to be at this certain age? Why can't we have the people that are excel in math be together, the people that excel in English be together, and they'll all meet at some point in time, but it's something that primitive. And I, I know there's, that's too simplistic, and I know there's good reasons why we want to do them all together, but, you know, I mean, I, it doesn't seem like we very often accelerate people or we hold people back. It's pretty rare when that stuff happens. Certainly when we were growing up, it seemed to happen more, but maybe I'm wrong on that statistically, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I'm just saying, so why do we do things the same way when we're no longer an agricultural society, we're no longer an industrial society, we're the knowledge society? And then we have that same format, the same structure, so to speak, is what we have. So how do we jump out of that box? And we're really jumping out of that box. And, and Rick, I, I'm with you 100%, because mm -hmm. the two things I came away from an excitement standpoint mm -hmm. versus a how do we approach this standpoint was the time element of learning mm -hmm. that you point out, and also the different um, things to be learned. Or I, I'm not going to say that correctly. You guys will correct me. Folks that uh, are better in literature and reading, not necessarily in math, and vice versa, or their growth rates in each of those yeah. being so different. How do you how do we accommodate that in the future? Like you said, it's it's to me that was the, the interesting thing our community might want to really delve into and think about. Yeah, yeah. It's the meat of that. It's a challenge to us to think differently. And even just the content area, the things that we said so important to have, you know, the reading and writing arithmetic, know the historical facts. Are those really still as important today as that they were 40 years ago? Yes. Really? Versus the other things we should be learning that weren't an option back then. I don't know. But I, I found it very stimulating. I would love to have a community-wide conversation on the book. I would. I think it's a great idea of how we do that. And you're right. The second half of the book, where they were talking about the how-tos of the great conversation, we've been through that a lot. Not that we can't glean some good things from there and suggestions, but I was more interested in the first half of the content, quite frankly, because that really stimulated the creative thought process to challenge what we do and why we do it. I, I would just make a few other comments too on the in the beginning of the book. I found it interesting how they they did the historical part, but also when they talked about how kids learn and and how they're they at that one point they were equating uh, IQ and some kids can learn and some kids can't, and then they brought in this bell curve that had all these different areas of learning, like you alluded to, Rick, and that most people are going to be in all those eight different areas on on this three-dimensional bell 
curve, so to speak, because of different factors and learning styles and this and that. It's not that you can't learn math if you're more of an English. I mean, my own children, I saw that. But because of the way we teach and you have such a structured time, you know, you have to know this and this and this by a certain time, that some of our kids don't get that time and that challenge, um, that opportunity to learn. And where they're emphasizing every kid has the ability to learn, it's just at what pace and what and how much and in what area. And that um, we need to make that change, you know, that all kids are capable of so much knowledge because they are calling this the knowledge age. And you know, what, is, what is important and how fast and, and how they learn and who they learn it with. Just a lot of challenges, exciting things I thought that were in this book. But then I started thinking, now what does it, what have we done as MPS? And I thought, you know, we've done a little bit of this. We've, we've, we're challenging certain kids with the IB program, you know, critical thinking and a different way of learning. My own daughter said, man, it's hard to write the way they want you to write. It's hard to think this way, but they were challenged in a new way. And, um, you know, whether kids are in the technical area, that technology, and even if it comes to autos, auto mechanics and that, that they're computerized. It's just a whole different way of thinking. So there are a lot of different skills that kids need to learn and adults need to learn and teachers, I thought too, just we are all so programmed to do it the old fashioned way that that is the biggest challenge is to get everybody to understand that change is needed and it doesn't have to be extreme. It's going to be a little bit at a time, but we are at a different stage in life. We, culture is different. The expectations are different. <coughs> Let me just add to that. I, I think one of the things I was layering here, and we all probably personalize this to our own kids, is how do you enable the students to reach their maximum potential? Mm -hmm. How do they reach it? And we've got these almost artificial mechanisms and measurements that we've had forever, A's, B's, and C's, and MEEP scores, and this and that, and, and, and whatever. Just because somebody has an A or, or gets a 1500 on an SAT, it doesn't mean they've reached the potential. And so how do you take, I think that's how do you take every single student and how do you know when you hit the potential, but how do you move as far as possible? Because you might have a child, you know, we probably all have these in our house, you know, who got a certain grade, but they may have worked harder than a child who got a higher grade. You know, maybe this child reached the potential before this kid did, you know, what an opportunity we've lost to do that. And how do we create a structure where Every kid goes as high as they possibly can, not being governed. Well, I got my A, or I got my 90%, so therefore I'm obviously where I need to be. Oh no, you know we could have straight A kids in any of our households and say, you know what, they still haven't reached the potential. And how do we enable them to do that and empower them to do that? That's the thing that I came away from here. And I, I know what the right structure is, but I would say that our current structure, as I described before, isn't taking a high percentage of our kids to their maximum potential. The, the thing I saw Rick, to that point is his point sorting how schools yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. were designed so these left. sorting mechanisms from day yeah. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they still are in most and, parts yeah. of the world. And yeah. that was a that was a I won't call it a Eureka, but it was a really interesting understanding mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. to grasp going, Oh my gosh, he's right. It was and and you know, I lived the system to do that. Mm -hmm. Get good grades, go to college, you know, sort out those. And we struggle with this uh, feeling that everybody needs to go to college. You know, I, I've always struggled with that thought. Um, what everybody needs to do is learn, and what everybody needs to do is learn to, the, to their optimum mm -hmm. potential, and where that lands them, it lands them. Mm -hmm. And and I liked his thinking in that way, of skewing the bell curve of knowledge, not to be the those that go on and those that don't go on, because tomorrow's workers don't mm -hmm. get the benefit of what 50 years of workers did of not have to think when you went to work. Mm -hmm. You know, you just went to work yeah. Yeah. and have a good job without without some. Uh, educational skills and nowadays I loved his bell-shaped curve skew where he said nope that doesn't acceptable anymore kids are going to have to all kids will have to have certain skills or unskilled labor is worthless mm -hmm. and uh, I thought that was a very valid point how do we give all the kids skills and what skills are those mm -hmm. and how do we deliver them is a topic I think our, our community needs to have we've got some feedback from uh, some of our large-scale uh, employers in the area that even engineers coming <coughs> out of Purdue and major universities um, are not used to being challenged with rigor once they get to the job site 
and that is creating some barriers, um, even for some of our large companies. Translate that into an experience that some of our high school administrators will find themselves put in a pickle, really. And it really is the result of the point system that we have with our classes at the high school. We intentionally sort and select kids here at Midland Public Schools based on what we perceive to be the rigor involved in those classes. We don't do that just because our educators think that's a good idea. We do that because that is in part a response to what our community wants us to do. And our high school administrators will sometimes find themselves in the position where a youngster has taken an upper level rigorous class, a point three or point four, and with a student um, who would typically get an A on all their work, not just their final grades or final tests, when it appears that that is dropping into an A minus or a B plus range, we will have some parents come in and insist that we drop down to the next level because it's more important to have the A than to stretch that student who could become the engineer and learn from that stretching experience and be a better engineer when they come out of college. Mm -hmm. And that is a cultural community norm mm -hmm. that we should probably have some conversation about. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know, what was interesting, a lot of what we're talking about is they, uh, in the book it said, for the first time in American history, there's been a flip-flop of the learners to labor ratio mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and how the lines are blurred between those that are thinkers and doers. doers yeah. and that's kind of what, like with Kathy, when we had that panel for 21st century learning, a lot of that skill set was on there, dynamic, critical thinking, teamwork, and so forth, is kind of the skill set of the future. And I worry about that with a lot of our really young kids. You know, are they, is the labor market and the competitiveness on a national uh, scale uh, going to put us in trouble? Because a lot of what the book talked about is the industrial revolution compared to the information age. And uh, it is it is here. It is happening now. Um, just the just being the board member that sits on the school improvement committee, it, it was kind of interesting. Is sometimes we we need to be happy for um, looking at what is we we have been successful already. And this is my experience in the university setting and and uh, optometry school curriculums is that good curriculums change. And to continue to stay successful, and experience continued success forward, you have to change. And that requires uh, not just staying in one spot. And on the school improvement community, I wasn't hearing a whole lot from our community that we're screaming out, you know, yeah, yeah, we need to look at best practices and so forth, but the achievement data is there. Um, so we don't want to get lazy and sit back and say, well, that's good enough. But I wasn't hearing really screaming out, begging, we got to change right now, but it's, it's worth having this conversation. And I really think that this great conversation started back in 2008, 2009, just in kind of thinking what I would say at this board meeting is that we involved, what, 40, 50 community members in developing the vision statement. That vision statement gives you the framework in which to incorporate the change and go forward to keep us great and continue to be successful. And um, you know, I, I think that we kind of got our charge from that. Um, I think the time is right. I think people are seeing changes out in the world that they haven't seen before. Uh, how relevant is the education preparedness for the workplace? Um, and I think really the, the time is right uh, with uh, with Blake here being our technology director, we are now getting our teeth into some real nuts and bolts of what we need to move technology forward. Having this conversation now can get our community on board as far as what we need to do with technology in the district. And we are now, because you know, you know, you've needed some time to get on board and to get things going and get us actually, what do we need? What's the nuts and bolts of moving this forward? And I think the time is right for that. And then I think that our, our community has really been well, res uh, well received the 21st century learning skills. So, I mean, that's what I took away from it. But this right here is, is the means of which we can engage the community. And I think what we're talking about is this flip-flop with, um, with what there's not as many laborers, there's more skilled, high technology, advanced manufacturing need in, in, the, in the country. Anybody else? Yes, sir. The, the fun part of going out and opening this discussion is going to be that, that whole uh, nostalgia issue of of what should be right. and this whole time sorting concept is a is a whole <coughs> thought process um, and so it'll be very interesting to me from hearing from different elements of the community and how to not get them to jump to the how the how is going to be well we need a tech ed center we need advanced uh, gifted and talented school we need uh, a 
laptop in every kid's hands, the hows should be the last part of the discussion. And the what we're going to deliver has got to be the first part of the discussion. And it will be very interesting to me how we can galvanize the community and avoid the race to the conclusion and think a little bit more about what we're trying to achieve before we discuss and get mired in the house. Because the house been the, as you jump to house, A, you'll miss your target, and B, they become emotional debates because people have different visions of what really the what is, and so they debate the how instead of debating the what. And Jerry, another element is why is there the need to change? And we've, yes. we've talked a little bit about that. The governor, on, the governor's vision of education, anytime, any place, any pace, anywhere, you know, some version of that, makes it easier for us to have this conversation with our community. I have shared with our two high school principals that um, hard as this would be in my home high school, much less a community that has the long, rich history of loyalty and passion and enthusiasm for the two high schools here. I believe what's going to happen in the next decade with high schools is it's going to become the education at high schools. It will become less about the high schools and more about program options for students. So if we were to ever go down the new tech path or a STEM academy, that's a program. That's an option. If we were to do more with pushing an awareness of the online opportunities that we could be providing now with our parents, um, that will get parents choosing some of those options. And we're almost moving to a system, and it's going to happen even at the college level, where parents can pick and choose from a menu of options to put together their high school diploma or their degree. Mm -hmm. And you can see schools are beginning to structure themselves in a way to manage more of those options and maintain as much of their traditional high school as they always have, uh, because that's where we've always been. But I think you're going to see massive change there. And you know what's really funny is that when you mention that Carl Ball program options, I'm thinking of the conversation Rick was just having is why not allow them to go to their potential? What works best for them? Break down the walls, the yep. physical walls yeah. and the mental walls. That program we have. options versus everybody's in the yeah. school, everybody goes for well, the same why, and that, why isn't MPS as a district the same as a college <coughs> campus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you think, it, just to think differently. Like, a university has many different buildings. And kids go to different buildings for different things and different programs and different classes and different blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Why, why can't a, a, a public school district be the same? Why well, is, I think why has the high school got to be one building to contain everything? You know, it, it'll be an interesting discussion. I'm not advocating anything. It's no. just to be thought provoking. Well, I think, Dr. Kaminsky, did you see something like that in Sonoma Valley? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Well, and I think it, I think if you look at it historically, if you if any of us have read anything about um, other countries and how they're delivering their educational experience to students, uh, some of what you're suggesting is already there. Plus, you know, their their career path choice is uh, made early on, and so that they have a very defined mo uh, plan in place. Which has but its negatives. It does. The, it does. We have the philosophy, but we have the philosophy to have all of our citizens have. A, a certain standard to education, not shortcut them at sixth grade and you go into technical. Right. So I mean, but you can still fulfill that philosophical goal as a as a, a nation's uh, education system by by having different options that maybe are ability better suited to their ability. But if we started with a clean slate today, and it's impossible for us to ever think like this because we've been part of the system for 200 years, yep. and so this is what people need to learn <laughs> to advance to be successful in life, if you will, and in a career situation we would look very, very differently. We are so hung up on the walls and the structures and the grades and the buildings and, and scores and metrics and all that stuff. We can't ever think past that. I would love for us somehow, in some form, generate, I don't know, five to 10, just off the wall, out of the box, radical ideas. Just get them out there and start a conversation. You know, and at first everybody will say, everybody will twist and turn out of fear and anxiety and, and stuff. But maybe the more you talk about it, the more light bulbs will go on and say, no, but how about this? And let's think differently. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do that because we're all kind of stuck in the mud, even though we all think we're out of the box thinkers. We're they'll not. Say that, we're not. That's the idea of that guy who was on your board in the last three or four months, Carl. <laughs> yeah. So well, I, I don't know. That's I, what I hope from doing the community of what we need. Like you yeah. were saying that, you know, graduates, if they don't have what companies are looking for, that that's where it needs to be driven. Let me paint you this know, picture. Instead, it's like driven from every kid now needs so much of this and so much of that. And, I mean, you need a degree in math to figure out. I mean, now that we're going into high school, to figure out that point system. 
And then some people, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Do I do point 0.4? Do I do point 0.3? Will I get into college if I only do point 0.3 and not right. point 0.4? And well, but this college, you know, cares and this college doesn't. And, and instead, it's like you said, what's really best for my child? But and, and here's what I feel badly about for our teachers. I mean, our, our, our teachers are doing the best they can to contribute to the long-term financial security of this district like other employee groups down. I'm proud of them for doing that. It wasn't easy to get to this point on any of us, frankly. But I'm proud of them for being there. But teachers are going to begin to get evaluated with Z scores to the one thousandths of one percent for every class they teach every period of the day. That is taking that kind of accountability and that is discounting the art and the role modeling and everything that educators do with mm -hmm. kids that isn't quite so nice and clean that fits in that measurement box. Now, we should be held accountable for the public dollars and making sure that we have high quality educational experiences for kids. I, I wouldn't hide from that and I wouldn't encourage the district to hide from it. That should apply to administrators and teachers. But when the pendulum swings that far and the way you analyze those Z scores through the, through the Bureau of Assessment and Accountability gets so complicated that even our own Bob Cooper, who is a math specialist here, says, I have trouble understanding and interpreting 13 pages of directions for how to interpret just one of those assessments. There's something wrong about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we need to have our community understand that. I mean, we had five schools that were targeted as focus schools. All five of those schools, this community would say there's good quality education that goes on there. Now, it helped us identify a gap between our top 30% performing students and bottom 30, but it wasn't like we didn't know that gap existed. And it wasn't like Kathy in the school improvement committee that John had via the school improvement plans that have targeted strategies aren't working as hard. We may have to go back and tweak them and do something different, but good people in district like, districts like Midland will, will go ahead and do that. This community success panel that I talked about, the community group with some of our civic leaders and so on on it, have asked me to come back on behalf of the school district with what our priorities are as a district. And you know what, they asked that of me back when we met in June or May. I'm struggling with that because I could come up with a list, I could work with the agenda group or the administrative group or us educators, but that's not enough. It has to be the community working hand in hand with the educators. We need to point out all those options so it's not just the traditional offerings. But if a group like the Community Success Panel that wants to embrace education perhaps differently than we've done are willing to partner with us to do it, we can capture, I think, some synergy with that group in carrying on this community conversation. We can do the same thing with My Tech Plus. They're very attuned to international competencies that our students have to have that are going to make them truly competitive, even our college educated students. Well, that needs to be part of the conversation, but that shouldn't drive everything that we do as a school district. And that's what I thought this book would do to spur some conversation amongst all of you. There are roles for all of you to step up and be champions for moving this conversation forward. We could probably talk for another hour about this. I just wanted to get it out there in front of you. And so tonight, from my point of view, I'd like you to take a couple of weeks and think about how could we strategize around this and say, what do you want to do as the leaders of the board to move this conversation forward? And I would ask you to think about that for a couple of weeks. And I'll do the same thing with the, the folks that I work most closely with here. Very good. Thanks for suggesting we read it. It's yeah, very good. you're welcome. I've heard and read the Blueberry story for 15 years. I didn't realize that. You know, came from him or something. Yeah. Uh, yep. Very good. Anything else for the good of the order? If not, I'll take or ask for a motion to adjourn. We are adjourned at 823. Should have voted on it, but.